Why go to a doctor when you can easily get a diagnosis with a few keystrokes on a computer? You enter in your symptoms, add a few clarifying details, and boom, a few seconds later, immediate results, custom made, emotionally attuned, compassionately delivered, all just for you. Diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, on demand and instant gratification. That's what our society now expects. A click of a button and an Uber shows up. A tasty burger gets delivered and groceries magically teleport to your door. But to see a doctor, you might as well make an appointment with Santa Claus. First, you need insurance. Oh, but not just any insurance. It has to be the right insurance. The six different clinics you call over the next few hours won't accept yours. The seventh one will, but the next available appointment is in what? Five months? Are you kidding me? Your frustration explodes and you scream into the phone, telling them that if you wait that long, you'll probably be dead. The receptionist cackles gleefully in response and then says some not very nice things about your mother. Realizing you have no recourse, you schlep yourself over to the only option there is, the local ER. In the waiting room, you're surrounded by people sicker than dogs. Bird flu, monkeypox, Ebola, toe fungus. Oh, and Bob, what's he doing here? You often see him standing in his usual spot outside Starbucks. But hey, looks like he's here with you now. He acknowledges your presence by sneezing on you. By the time you get a room in the ER, almost 12 hours have gone by. Another eternity later, the doctor finally arrives. Hooray, finally, the moment of truth. You're going to be saved. Tears start streaming down as you look into the kindly face of your savior. Blinking back the tears, however, you realize he's already gone. He was in the room for what, a max of five minutes? A few yes or no questions and he's out of there? Some way, somehow, you feel even worse. This was supposed to be it. This was supposed to be your moment. You've gotten better customer service at the local grimy auto repair shop than you have here. The stupid hospital poster on the wall that says, you matter, we care, is utter horse feces. You think to yourself, is it just me? Am I just too stupid to understand what was discussed? Too sensitive because you didn't like how the doctor acted? Too needy because you still have questions left unspoken? Left to fend for yourself once more, you can't help but ask, why does the healthcare system suck so hard today? In the era where technological growth has exploded, why does the hospital feel like it's still stuck in the 19th century? These were the exact questions Courtney desperately grappled with as she tried to figure out what was wrong with her poor boy. Today's true story is about Alex, who up until the age of four was a happy and healthy boy until one day he mysteriously succumbs to an illness that ravages his body with a pain that not only stunts his growth, but results in him walking with a limp. His mother brings him to see a total of 17 doctors over the span of three years, none of which are able to help him until it is chat GPT that ultimately puts the pieces together recognizing the mysterious illness for what it is. I'll walk you through exactly what happened, why so many doctors failed him, the parent controversy surrounding this story, and what you should do from now on to ensure this never happens to you or your family. If you're new here, welcome. I'm a board certified doctor with both a medical degree from Yale and an undergraduate degree from Harvard. This entire channel is dedicated to improving health literacy through the telling of interesting stories. If that sounds appealing to you at all, then please subscribe and hit the notification bell. It is 2020. The WHO had just declared COVID-19 a global health emergency. Courtney had just set up a bouncy house for her two young kids. After a quiet afternoon playing, Alex tells his nanny that, it hurts. Thinking he may have hurt himself playing in the bouncy house, his nanny gives him some Motrin and tells him to rest. All appear to be well for now. Curiously, this pattern would repeat itself over the next few days. Motrin was the only thing that would calm Alex down. Without it, he would turn into a monster and have a gigantic meltdown. Checking his body from head to toe, Courtney couldn't find anything wrong. There weren't any obvious bruises and he appeared to be walking around without issue. Could something be broken? A hairline fracture? These episodic tantrums soon took on a new form and included a curious habit of chewing on things. Putting two and two together, his family assumed the tantrums were caused by something dental, erupting molars or bad cavities, so off to the dentist they went. But the dentist could not figure it out. Alex's teeth were just fine. It's probably because Alex has been grinding his teeth, he concluded. He should probably see an orthodontist. And so, just like that, the first torch was passed. Little did Courtney know, Alex's three-year-long saga had just begun. The orthodontist Alex saw was a specialist in airway obstruction. His conclusion for Alex was that the issue was due to airway obstruction. Hmm, 
What a coincidence. Conclusion was this. Alex's palate was too small for his mouth and teeth. This would make breathing at night difficult and interrupt the quality of his sleep, explaining why Alex was moody and exhausted all the time. And so, an expander was fitted for Alex's palate. There was some improvement, but not much. Alex was still pretty moody and devoid of energy. Because the palate expander didn't solve the issue, it was assumed the obstruction was in his sinus passageways. Thus, the torch was passed to an ENT doc. A specialized camera was jammed up into the nasal cavities, but apart from mucus and the usual boogers, all appeared to be just fine. Another curious thing had happened. Alex had stopped growing taller. The pediatrician brushed it away, blaming it on the pandemic, explaining that it was negatively affecting his development. However, the doctor zeroed in on something even more strange. Alex was walking funny. He would lead with his right foot and drag his left foot along for the ride. In the same vein, Alex also never liked sitting cross-legged. When asked to do so, he would simply refuse. The family just assumed that all of these things were just how Alex was. Some kids don't like meatballs. Some kids don't like to go on swings. It's not a big deal, right? Only later would the family learn just how important this diagnostic clue would be. But at the time, it was just another idiosyncrasy brushed under the rug along with the rest of Alex's quirks. Only problem was, his little collection of quirks was growing larger and larger. Either way, the pediatrician recommended physical therapy, and so dutifully, off to the physical therapy they went. There, the therapist listens to what is going on. Fatigue, irritability, sleeping issues, episodic pain episodes, delayed development, walking problems, and headaches. Though she wasn't a doctor, her opinion on the matter was that Alex's constellation of symptoms sounded like a problem with the brain. Specifically, something called a Chiari malformation. In this disease, the brain is too big for the skull that houses it. Because of this mismatch, the part of the brain known as the cerebellar tonsils are squeezed out of the skull like toothpaste from a tube, causing a whole range of various neurological symptoms, including headaches, irritability, and fatigue. This was the first time anyone had brought this up. In fact, prior to this discussion, Alex had already seen a neurologist for the headaches and was given a diagnosis of migraines. Could it be a Chiari malformation instead? Why didn't any doctor mention this possibility before? Wanting a second opinion, the family makes an appointment with a whole new crop of doctors. A new pediatrician, a pediatric internist, an adult internist, a musculoskeletal doctor. At some point in time, an MRI is performed too. Despite a whole new crop of doctors and tests, no one could give Alex a solid unifying diagnosis. Maybe it's this? Maybe it's that? Why don't we Let's try, try this? Let's revisit how Alex is doing in two I'll weeks I'll see him time. in another month. Go to the ER. If anything crazy happens, or if you can't reach me in I'm sure time. he'll feel better. He'll grow out of it. It's probably nothing. And so that's how it went. Visit after visit, the same half-baked apology, the same hopeful platitudes and well wishes. And all the while, Alex continued to suffer. Not to mention, the mountain of paperwork and medical bills coming in was pure comedic gold, given how little things were improving. And just like that, three slow, painful years crawled by. Alex was nowhere close to returning to the happy, bright, shining boy he once used to be. Something clearly was wrong. Why couldn't anyone help him? It was at this moment that Courtney finally took matters into her own hands. She had known about ChatGPT for some time. Friends and family had all raved about it. There were even stories about the program passing the bar exam and the United States medical licensing exam too. At this point, what did she have to lose? She was desperate. She fed the model as much information as she could, carefully reconstructing the previous three years in explicit detail for the algorithm to process. She plugged in Alex's symptoms and included every possible detail that might have been swept under the rug so long ago. Even the MRI report was fed into the model line by line. At some point, ChatGPT began offering possible suggestions. Out of all the possibilities, one diagnosis stood out above the rest. It was something she had never heard of before. Tethered cord syndrome. The spinal cord hangs loosely like a hammock all the way from the base of the skull to the tailbone and has a certain degree of elasticity to accommodate any twisting, flexion, or extension you do with your back. However, in tethered cord syndrome, a part of the spinal cord becomes abnormally tethered, like a garden hose caught in the bushes. Until you manually free it, you won't be able to pull the hose any further without ripping it apart. Any number of things can tether the spinal cord. A tumor, scar, or fatty tissue, or even congenital structural defects. Of course, you don't know this is going on, and so you continue on with your life, flexing and twisting your back like nobody's business, forcing the tethered portion of the spinal cord to stretch in a way it is not designed to do. Given enough stretches, you destroy the spinal cord, inducing irreversible biochemical and electrophysiologic damage. Was this what was going on in Alex's back? 
Courtney began joining Facebook groups for families with children diagnosed with a condition. There, she dutifully went through post after post, all detailing stories that seemed oddly familiar. The pain episodes, the odd walking, the violent outbursts, her son's tiny frame suddenly quivering with gruesome energy, small fists clenching and unclenching, punctuating the air with staccato bursts of indignation. Each scream uttered a deafening thunderclap. Each wail emitted high-pitched and raw, disturbingly synchronized with the violent contortions and twisting that would come to possess his tiny body almost as if he was trying to break free from the confines of reality itself. Could his body have known this this entire time? Was each episode simply the subconscious trying helplessly to disentangle the tethered knotted cord that was dangerously becoming stretched too thin? Why had no one ever brought up this possibility? Armed with a renewed sense of purpose, Courtney takes Alex to see Dr. Holly Gilmer, a pediatric neurosurgeon at the Michigan Head and Spine Institute, and tells her what she suspects the diagnosis to be. Dr. Gilmer takes a look at the MRI and confirms the family's suspicions. She takes Alex to the operating room to release the tethered cord. The procedure is apparently straightforward and Alex is now recovering from the operation. Spina bifida occulta, complicated by tethered cord syndrome is Alex's official diagnosis. In his particular version of the disease, Alex has apparently a congenital defect that prevents the proper development of his lower backbones. Without the normal structures in place to enclose and protect the spinal cord, it ends up growing in a distorted fashion, becoming tethered in place by the surrounding defects. This defect apparently also manifested in several other areas of the body, offering subtle diagnostic clues that may have helped a more astute clinician solve the mystery sooner. Number one, Alex had always had a curious birthmark right above his gluteal crease, aka the butt crack. This was not just any ordinary birthmark, but the continuation of the congenital spinal abnormality underneath, spilling onto the surface of the skin above. This mark can be quite subtle, sometimes manifesting as just a single dimple, a tiny red spot, or even a tuft of hair, the proverbial tip of the iceberg hiding the massive spinal deformity underneath. Number two, Alex also had a crooked belly button, a frontal or abdominal manifestation of the abnormal development that likely occurred during the embryonic stages of life. Number three, the fact that Alex never liked crossing his legs. It is thought that this position puts increased tension on the spinal structures, stretching and aggravating the tethered cord even further. However, this is where the controversy begins. Not every doctor believes this case happened the way it has been described. This story has made its rounds in the physician community and a few camps have emerged. The first camp of doctors don't believe Alex has tethered cord syndrome. They say the symptoms don't all fit. Alex's primary complaint were headaches, while tethered cord pain centers on the back or groin area where the actual tethering occurs. Furthermore, the syndrome should also result in neurologic problems such as urinary incontinence and sensory deficits, all of which Alex does not appear to have. Some even go as far to say Alex's symptoms sound like the same symptoms of my overtired five-year-old who just started kindergarten. Some point out that we don't even know if the surgery worked to cure Alex's symptoms. At this point in time, as Alex is still on the road to recovery, the jury is still out. The second camp does believe the diagnosis of tethered cord, but doesn't think ChatGPT is really all that impressive. They say the AI algorithm came to the answer because it cheated, that it was basically given the answer. They argue that the MRI report most likely alluded to the disease in medical jargon, but may not have spelled out the diagnosis explicitly. For example, the MRI could have said low-lying conus with fatty phylum terminale. To the layperson, this line sounds like gibberish, but to chat GPT or any doctor with a sense of what to look for, this would be a major alarm bell and would immediately imply the cord was tethered until proven otherwise. If that were the case, that would mean chat GPT didn't really need any of the prior information Courtney fed into it. In fact, one could argue that all that information she gave may confuse the AI machine and rendered it useless. To test out this theory, I pretended to be Courtney and fed chat GPT Alex's story myself to see what would happen. It tells me it will do its best. Great. I promptly summarize the most salient parts of the case. I then ask ChatGPT, what do you think is going on with him and what should we do? Quite honestly, I am disappointed. ChatGPT gives me very generic and quite frankly unhelpful answers. They list three giant buckets, neurologic, musculoskeletal, and growth concerns. That's not very actionable at all. Unsatisfied, I pressed chat GPT further. Migraines, seizures, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's, growth hormone deficiency, leg length discrepancy, sensory processing disorder. 
It does bring in the cross-legged thing here, which I found interesting. Good to know is actually listening. It continues on, autism and other rare conditions. Better, but still not anywhere close to the mark. This is why many doctors think ChatGPT didn't really do any heavy lifting at all. That it only got the answer after the MRI report fed it the answer. But if that were the case, why didn't a doctor pick that up from the MRI? Whoever ordered it must have read that supposed line too. One explanation is that the doctor who ordered the MRI read that line but didn't think tethered cord was the most likely explanation given Alex's large constellation of vague symptoms and thus ignored it. While that is possible, I must say it is kind of a faux pas to not explain and go over the entire report with the patient and family and discuss all possible diagnoses, especially given the context. When you know your patient's family is desperately looking for any and all possible explanations, all the more reason you, as the doctor, should take your time and carefully review everything, discussing all possibilities, however unlikely you may think the diagnosis of tethered cord is. The second explanation is that Courtney somehow obtained an MRI without an ordering doctor responsible for interpreting it. While possible, this scenario is less likely, unless you are a VIP patient that is rich or have some sort of backdoor loophole. Most of these imaging tests require a doctor's specific order, kind of like how you need a prescription to get any non-over-the-counter drugs. The final explanation is that there is no such line on the MRI report. Not all tethered cord can be obviously seen on the MRI and hence why the doctor who ordered it may not have been prompted to think about it. But if that were the case, that brings us back to our original question. How did ChatGPT figure out the diagnosis? This is when I went back to ChatGPT and added in a few more clarifying details. What if I told you Alex had a funny birthmark above his gluteal crease, that he has a crooked belly button too? Combining what I've told you thus far with this new information, does that make you think of a more specific diagnosis now? Bingo. I didn't feed in any relevant MRI details and ChatGPT finally brings up tethered cord syndrome as a possibility. To be fair, I did pretty much force ChatGPT to consider the diagnosis by highlighting some pretty obvious medical clues. Did Courtney include these details too? I have no idea, but if she did, good for her. They are pretty subtle and easily missed. In reality, these findings were probably pointed out to her by the neurosurgeon after the fact. Point is, with the right clues, it is possible for ChatGPT to give specific diagnoses, but be careful. I do not think it is ready for prime time. ChatGPT has been known to hallucinate, fabricating information when it doesn't know the answer, sometimes even citing imaginary journal articles with fake titles and authors that sound pretty legit. With that said, modern medicine is definitely due for an overhaul. Many doctors are indeed siloed in their own practices, constrained by time and limited resources, burnt out by a never-ending slew of metrics dictated by faceless administrators who have no idea what it is like to practice medicine. While the end of medicine isn't here yet, we are definitely heading towards some boring dystopian version of it. Alex's story is but one example of how someone can easily fall through the cracks of our broken healthcare system, neglected and underserved. So where do we go from here? What can you do to ensure you get the best care possible? First, you must realize one thing. Doctors are very good at diagnosing the common, the obvious, the bread and butter of medicine that we all learn and study. Abdominal pain in the right lower quadrant, probably appendicitis. Crushing chest pain traveling down the left arm in someone with high blood pressure and cholesterol, probably a heart attack. But chronic abdominal pain ongoing for years that five different specialists cannot diagnose, vague fatigue symptoms that come and go for months on end, much more difficult. Could pretty much be anything. The longer your symptoms have been going on for, and the more off the beaten path you find yourself, the more difficult things will be for you. That is why your number one priority is to find a doctor you trust, someone who is willing to work with you over the long run. They may not have immediate answers for you, but if they can sit with you and listen to you, then they are a keeper. You need a doctor willing to be your guardian, your curator, your guide. ChatGPT is not that person. ChatGPT can be a great resource to learn from, to supplement and to add color to the conversation you have on your healthcare journey, but it does not replace a doctor. Don't understand something in your medical report or your blood work? Ask ChatGPT to explain it to you like you are five before you broach the subject with your doctor. Want a quick primer on stroke before you head to the ER for your grandpa who now has a limp arm and slurred speech? Ask it to synthesize everything a family member should know about stroke in less than 1,000 words. Ask it to give you the TLDR version of the latest health articles and cutting edge signs for stroke. 
Then ask it for a list of the best rehab centers near you and who also happen to accept your grandfather's insurance. Then tell it to generate a checklist of medication reminders, to-dos, contingencies, and care plan discussions you should have with your doctor before your grandpa is discharged from the hospital. Goal isn't to treat ChatGPT as a doctor, but as an insanely smart medical assistant to aid you in your journey. And with it, you become an informed advocate for yourself and your family. As the AI revolution explodes, more and more tools are bound to crop up. If topics surrounding the intersection of AI and healthcare are interesting to you, then please comment below. This entire channel is dedicated to using interesting stories to give you a behind the scenes look and increase health literacy overall. Speaking of which, check out this next video on the science behind cryonics. In it, we'll talk about whether or not you can actually free someone and bring them back from the dead. As always, please like, share, and subscribe to Spoon Fed Med. Studies show that hitting the subscribe button makes you two times more likely to find an empathetic doctor who listens to you. Also, if you made it this far, tell me what kind of stories you want to hear next. Until next time, my friends, stay humble, stay healthy, stay fresh. Peace.